Welcome everyone. Are we on? Welcome everyone. Welcome. That's better. Can you hear me? Better. Okay. Welcome everyone. Is that better? People oh, yeah. can hear? I can't hear. Okay. Okay, good. Welcome everyone. I'd like to get started. Before I begin, how many of you have one of these little smartphones of some sort? Right. How many of you seen, have seen people walking around kind of doing this, right? How many of you been, have been those people walking around? So here's what happened to me. I was in Las Vegas. I had a lunch meeting. And I was away all day, and I'm trying to run my business off of this thing. So I excused myself to go to the bathroom and, of course, check my email. So I'm walking across to the bathroom doing this. And before I know it, I look up and I look around, and there are all women around me. <laughs> and I, I just said, i got to pay attention, and I walked out. That was enough. <laughs> so let that be a lesson to all of us. So today's topic is green. Um, and I took a different perspective because, as you know, there's a lot of research out there about green consumption, how many people recycle and how many people do this and how many people do that, using the broad American panel. But we couldn't find anything about green consumers as, if you will, a niche market or a segment. What makes them tick? What will it take for us to attract their business and to earn their loyalty? A little bit about my company, um, CMI Green is part of Community Marketing Inc. We specialize in a variety of very important market segments. Um, LGBT is a big part of what we do. You may have heard me speak about LGBT meetings at previous uh, WECs. Uh, tourism and hospitality, most of our clients are really in this, in this segment, CSR and so forth. And then our methodologies are the standard research methodologies of surveys, focus groups, advisory boards, and so forth. So we're developing this green segment as something that, that we really are committed to, and that's why we did this study. So a little bit about me before I begin. Um, back in 1969, I went to my first Earth Day. And back in those days, the whole environmental movement was so exciting and so cutting edge. Everybody was behind it, and everybody was doing things to make sure that they were more green, more environmental, more eco. You remember the earth flag and, of course, the, the eco symbol, right? But then what happened? Gas got cheap again, and we bought SUVs, and we kind of lost track. And I love this quote, the horrible to see everything that one detested in the past coming back wearing the colors of the future. Here we are again, facing the same challenges, hopefully this time more permanently, from our perspective, hopefully this time based on research and practicality and ROI, where it isn't a waving the earth flag decision, it's a ROI decision to make our practices more sustainable. So what I'd like to talk about today are a few different things. First of all, I'll talk about our research, how we did the research and so forth. One thing as a research person that drives me crazy is when people start throwing numbers at me and they don't say where they got those numbers and who they represent and what we're even talking about. So I want to cover our method, methodology. MPI is one of our partners in this. Um, and a profile of the greener consumer. And I know that we're talking about the meeting profession. But I wanted to start off with consumers because everybody you know, at our foundation are individuals and we're consumers. So what makes us tick? What are some of the motivations and, and sensitivities and skepticisms that we face as consumers? And then I'm going to take it to the next step as business travel consumers. And then I want to do a profile of meeting professionals and some of the, some of the things that we found about meeting professionals and how we're making a dent in that segment. I'm going to start wrapping up um, with some case studies of hotels and CVBs. Um, and then I'll give you sort of a profile of the high level of the report. But um, just first of all, what is the, uh, the green travel um, study? It's about green travelers as an emerging niche market. And some of you may be offended by the concept of green being a niche market since it's so universally important. But we're focusing on consumers that are kind of cutting edge. So as I said, this isn't a 
profile of Americans. This is a profile of a subset of Americans who identify as being very eco-conscious and travelers, okay? So that's who we're talking about. So it's not a general study of USA consumers. It is um, really a profile of this cutting edge segment. So what is in the study? It's 150 pages. It covers personal travel, what makes you green, some of the motivations, things that practically we're doing, media consumption, which magazines we're reading, which newspapers, which websites, marketing motivations, hotels, restaurants, cruises, volunteerism is a big segment of the study that I'm not even going to have time to touch on today, as well as travel philanthropy, another big segment of the, of the study that I can't touch on today. But the nice thing about the study is everybody gets a copy. Um, we create a PDF of it. And at the end, I'm going to give you uh, an email address that you just write to that email address, even sitting here at the end of this, and you'll get an autoresponder with the link, and you download it, and there you have it. Read it on the plane home. Um, but this is our give back. Um, we have been very fortunate in focusing on some segments that have been very good to us. And we're also very, as you could tell from my opening slides, very passionate about this topic. Um, ever since my teenage years, it's been something very important to me personally. So we have put this out there over the past few years, and we've gotten requests from Syria and South Africa and Argentina and Korea, South Korea, um, really literally all over the world, from academic institutions, from hotel groups, from tour operators, from airlines, from aircraft manufacturers. They're all getting a lot of good insight from this. So um, the way we did the study was we did partnerships. This is really how we do a lot of our research we take on partnerships. So in the case of the Green Study, we worked with ASTA, we worked with MPI, of course, we worked with NTA, we worked with USTOA, uh, Volunteer Match, Travelocity, um, Sustainable Travel International, uh, DMAI. So all of these different organizations it gave us input on the questionnaire. Okay? So they gave us a lot of insight in what they want answered as a result of this study. And we were very fortunate to have some sponsors in our second year that helped pay for some of the expenses. Um, but really, this is, this is something that we invest in. So what we did was we created these banners. And these banners in various sizes were then started to be placed on a variety of uh, websites. So they're on travel websites. They're on CVB websites. They're on DMA, DMAI, Planetara, Kimpton Hotels was a partner. They put it out to their lists. And then what happened was all these different channels of communication sent people to take our survey. So we had a really broad representation of this segment. And then we come to the profile of the greener traveler. Now, this is a research presentation, so therefore, by default, there will be a lot of charts. Okay? I will be happy to break it up. If you have comments, questions, whatever, I'll also try and embellish a little bit. I don't want to stand here and just kind of read chart after chart. But I think you're going to find what makes the greener traveler tick to be pretty fascinating. In fact, there's some things in here that, um, that may change the way you do business. So personal habits and trends. First of all, what is your understanding of what green travel is? Okay, This is really important for all of us in terms of our communications, whether we're focusing from the hotel or supplier side, or we are focusing on the end user side, the meeting attendee, which is ultimately who we're all talking about. Um, or your own practices, the eco-friendly hotel is the core of the greener travel experience, by far. And that core is really central to all communications and the overall experience. And I'm going to get into that in a couple minutes. What hotel environmental initiatives are most important to you? So how many of you are in the hotel world? Good. Okay. So these are some things that help make your end consumers tick. And what's interesting is this is really the first very consumer-based approach to this subject. And until now, there really hasn't been a lot of data about what makes us tick. So when you're creating your marketing plans and your imagery and your messaging and your offers, it's really important to know what they want. Because the best sale is, of course, delivering what the customer wants and is asking for. So if you offer recycling, hey, you're a big, a big uh, step of the way there. We're all staying, most of us who aren't in Orlando, are staying in hotels, right? How many of us have recycling bins in our hotel rooms? Yeah, I don't. So this is, this is a, a key factor in terms of our communications and delivering on the promise. Now, I'm going to answer the question 
I don't want you all to get up and leave when I answer it, but where's the ROI in green meetings? The ROI in green meetings isn't about marketing. It isn't about adding a little bit of extra money to give a greener experience. It's about operations. Where's the money being saved in energy efficiency, in water efficiency, in uh, occupancy controls, pulling your little card out as you walk out and then everything shuts down? These are motivations for consumers and very fortunately for all of us, they are also an amazing way to save money and deliver a, a more sustainable product. So the recycling bin, big pet peeve of mine. I actually stayed at a property in Vancouver that had a trash bin, a recycling bin, and a composting bin. That was a first. I loved that. And what they did was they put a little sign next to every instance in the rooms and also in the convention area next to the coffee. They had all these different bins and they had an explanation saying, this is what we're doing and this is why. Because otherwise it's sort of tedious and I don't even know where to throw my coffee cup, right? But if you understand the meaning behind it, you actually can gain a lot of loyalty and inspiration from that. So the recycling bin. What hotel? Coast. Oh, Kimpton also, yeah. Kimpton is actually one of my case studies. So how about these little bottles? How many of us have little bottles in our bathrooms, right? Most of us. So what happens to those bottles? This is a picture from um, the waterway just leading out of LAX, where most of these little bottles end up. And I don't want to get too depressing, but there's actually a, you may know this, a, uh, an island, basically, of trash in the Pacific. And now they're starting to find them pretty much in every ocean, consisting of these little bottles and all the other kind of stuff that we just sort of throw in our hotel trash bin and forget about and walk away. Um, and so this trash is fouling our waters and it's ending up in our waterfowl. I know this is really depressing, but it makes the point. So why not move in this direction, right? And you have to explain it. Otherwise, they're going to say, oh, this hotel's cheap. I don't get my little cute bottles of stuff, right? But if you explain it and say, this is really important to us and we believe it's important to you, then they'll get the message and they'll be very happy about it. And then, of course, they'll be more loyal. So when you traveled on vacation the last 12 months, the, again, these are the more eco-conscious. About 60% said that they were more conscious of the impact that their travel actions had on the environment. So these are very aware people. Which measures have you taken? First of all, they're turning off the lights. Again, that is something that helps us save money. Um, they also reuse their sheets and, and towels. Okay, so that's a good thing. It saves you tons of money if you're in the hotel world and it makes us feel good because we're doing something for the environment. We're saving all that suds and, and hot water and everything. And they conserved water. So these are all cost savings. This is where the ROI is. How have your environmental concerns impacted your discretionary travel? I thought this was pretty interesting. It is impacting. Um, more people are considering what, they, what they're doing to the environment and did something about it. 37%, for example, they bought carbon offsets. Um, some were so concerned they actually traveled less. And 1.3% uh, said that they even considered giving up discretionary travel. So we don't want travel to end, right? But we do want to make sure that we're doing the right thing so that travel doesn't end and we're also not ending our environment. So about half said that they were so influenced by environmental issues, they did something about it. Go ahead. Sure, I'll be happy to. The question was, what is a carbon offset purchase? Uh, for those who don't know, basically I can figure out how much um, carbon went into the air from my, from my flight from San Francisco. There's, there's all kinds of websites and charts and people who sell uh, carbon offsets. Then they can calculate how much you need to invest in alternative energy to bring that carbon back to zero, so to speak. You're still polluting, but you're creating also an offset, meaning you're, you're taking an approach to... to improve the environment as well. So the better ones are actually creating alternative energy options like wind um, or solar power. Um, some plant trees, but as we all know, those of us who are really insanely into this, um, that if you plant a tree, that's great. It sucks the carbon out. But then when the tree dies and decomposes, the carbon goes back in the air. So the best thing is alternative energy. So moving on. So what are the top motivators for us when choosing a hotel? 
I think we'll all find this interesting, whether we're on the supplier side or the meeting uh, professional side. Price, okay? These are the most eco-aware travelers. Price is the number one guideline. Location, quality, free internet room in the room, uh, online review of the property, brand reputation, location near attractions, reward program points. Hey, where are the green motivators? You see any? No, they're on page two. The hotel's environmental program motivates 25% approximately. Certification as a green property, 15%. Green uh, dining options on the premises, 13%. So even among these most dynamic, we could say, within this segment, we're finding a big challenge in terms of motivation. Okay? But once you deliver the product, the good news comes in that they actually use it. Okay? So we're seeing here a trend. The first trend is marketing really isn't motivating even these greenest of travelers to, to buy your product or service, okay? In this case, a hotel room. But if you offer greener services, then they use them, they feel better about, about your product or service, and they have that loyalty to you. Behind the scenes, you're saving money. So that's, again, where we're starting to get reinforcement of the ROI is on the operations side. In the past 12 months, what resources did you use to actually find out about greener options? The hotel zone website is very important. And I have some uh, case studies towards the end of my presentation that will demonstrate what some uh, companies are doing. But if you're in the hotel world, your own website is the number one resource. So it wasn't all good news, right? In terms of the consumer motivation from an advertising or marketing perspective. But the future looks a little bit greener, we could say. When would you be most likely to go on a greener vacation? About 75% indicate that they're, they're really planning, they're, they're starting to take those steps to purchase greener when they travel. And when making future travel plans, which of these statements do you agree with? I will shop for greener travel options or destinations, about 66%. And how much extra would you like to spend? Well, about 40% indicated 1% to 5%. So it's kind of like, well, maybe a little bit if I have to. But they're not really expecting to pay extra. And I think this is really important because some companies are feeling like, gosh, you know, we can make a little bit extra money by providing a little bit of extra greener service. Well, that's not what the consumers are thinking. And it's really important to know that. So green is perceived as a as an very appealing added value but it's not the motivator in its own right. Um, the ROI, again, comes from efficiency. So the green tax, we call it the green tax, they won't pay it. Don't do that. The other thing don't do is greenwashing. Do you know what greenwashing is? Everybody familiar with the term? No, let me explain. Okay, don't do it. First of all, here's a great example. This is my own personal pet peeve when I travel. I realize my impact on the environment when I travel. And so therefore, when I get that little card and it says, if you hang up your towel, we'll save all this hot water and we'll save all this detergent and you'll be doing a great thing, partnering with us to improve the environment. So not only do I hang the towel back on the rack, even if I'm there four days, I hang the towel back on the rack and I hang the card on top of the towel so that I'm saying, I know what I'm doing please don't replace my towels. And of course, I come back to the room and this is what I see, right? So this is crazy because number one, you're promising and number two, you're not delivering. That's like, why bother marketing if that's the kind of impression you're creating on your consumers? So this is a great case study, I think. The other thing about greenwashing is there are websites <laughs> out there and they are, this is an example of an airline, EasyJet, that was promoting its, you know, reduced carbon footprint and all that. And then they, this uh, website, Greenwashing Index, went in there and actually did a third party analysis and said, you know, this is greenwashing. And again, don't bother marketing if it's only going to get torn apart and then you're going to be shown to be a liar. You have to deliver on the promise. Yes. Yes. I know. Yes.
Yeah. yeah. To everybody. They do. I know. The point is, even with all this information, companies are still greenwashing, and that's a really big, important point. And I'm going to cover a little bit about the, the certifications that are out there and some of the skepticism that's out there about even the certifications. So I'm not here with a lot of answers. I'm here with research and what I'm sort of em emphasizing. But I can't answer why people still greenwash in any way. They pinkwash, too. They say they're gay-friendly, and then they're not, right? So they do all kinds of washing, and it just backfires. So let's talk about marketing co and communications and some of the, the issues that we're facing in terms of skepticism. So what are some of the terms? OK, we're all interested in green. We're all interested in sustainability. What are some of the terms that we should use in our marketing and advertising? Well. Socially re responsible and sustainable are the two terms that are by far the most important to this segment. So you might ask, where, well, where's green? The word green is way down here, 14%. And the color green is way down there at 6.5%. So this is what's telling us about this skepticism, right? You put a little green color on your ad or a little leaf or something like that, people don't feel that it's real because they've faced that kind of greenwashing. It's a challenge. That's why I said I don't have all the answers. I'm trying to find them through research. But really, this is a challenge. And we have to deliver on the promise. That is the solution to the challenge, is if we can all, as an industry, get together and deliver on the promise. Because, hey, it's not only good for the environment, but it's also good for our bottom line. So I took all the green out of the rest of my slides, because green is not a, <laughs> not a very appealing color. No, actually, I left it. So what are the, summer, uh, the primary drivers, OK? So what, what makes them tick? What are some of the reasons that they get behind a greener initiative? And it's really their concern for the environment and climate change. So they really are knowledgeable about this. They're generally better educated, this segment, and so forth. So those are some of the, the uh, motivators. We also asked other things, um, my health, my children's future, and so forth, which are also motivators and can be used in communication. But the main thing is that they are very concerned about the future of the planet. Do they trust the marketing? Let's talk about that a little bit. No, basically they don't. Um, what are, what's your opinion about these greener initiatives? Um, are they real or are they just marketing? And about 33% said that they are a marketing tool, but also it's good for the environment. So that's OK, actually. And 13% said it's a good way of protecting the environment. So about half are saying that green initiatives are genuine and they are motivators. But the other half are very skeptical. And again, these are the greenest of our, uh, of our consumer base. How do you determine that a travel supplier is truly environmentally friendly? They do respect third-party certifications. But there's a lot of skepticism about that, too, because they don't really know. There are so many, right? How many are there? Anybody know? Like 50 or something? And they're all competing, right? There's the green seal, and there's this leaf, and there's that, and there's this. And a consumer is just kind of bewildered by it. So from an industry standards perspective, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to consolidate and systemize, the, make the, the approach more systematic and make sure that, that the communication of these standards, which are really important because that takes away the opportunity to greenwash, they're not really understood. So let's talk a little bit about business travel before I get into uh, meeting travel and then the case studies. So how did we do this methodology? Out of the people who took the survey, we asked them also if they had uh, taken a business trip um, where they traveled overnight and spent a night in a hotel in the past 12 months. So this is the cohort of business travelers. So when you travel on business, has the, have you been more environmentally aware? And almost half, about 44%, indicated that they are also more conscious when they're in their business travel. That's not as strong as consumer travel. A lot of us aren't as much in control over where we travel and, and how we travel when we're on business travel, but they're still very aware of it as consumers who are on business travel. Does your company's travel policy recommend that you consider booking your air travel or hotel with the environment in mind? This was a shock. 
I think the, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the corporate client side to get them to support our green initiatives. Um, some companies are really taking huge steps in this direction. Others are still head in the sand, right? Their, their employees are consumers, and those consumers are very interested in this. When they see their company completely ignoring this, it reflects badly on their employer. When you attend a business event, do you expect the organizers to implement sustainable practices within the event? Now, this is good news for you, 81%. So they're on business travel. They expect that the events will be more environmentally progressive, 80% of them. And we're finding, and I'm going to sort of touch on this in my final summary, that the meeting profession is really the farthest along um, in terms of really making a difference in green. More far, more far along than consumers and certainly more far along than business travel. So a few points that we found from... Um, meeting professionals that we surveyed. There were about 200 of our cohort who plan meetings, and that's who I, I want to talk about just for a minute. But I also want to say, this is high level. I mean, there's a ton of deep information in, this, in the report, and I really encourage you, if you're into this, to just read it. Because you have two years of the study that are covered. We have our 19, where am I? 2009 study. And then we have our 2010 study, and all the changes that took place from 2009 to 2010 are highlighted in red. So you can start to see the trends. And when we do our next one, we'll pick another color and just sort of be able to, to highlight what's going on. So anyway, back to the, to the report. Uh, about 200 plan or manage business meetings. When organizing or planning a meeting or conference, does your company explicitly work to incorporate green meeting best practices? Again, 75%. So this is great because we saw for business travel, it was about, what, 72% said no. Now we're seeing 74%. When it comes to meetings, where the environment is more controlled and there's sort of a, a more connection to what we're doing with our environment, the meeting profession is really the, the we could say, the green light in the, in the industry. Which of these websites do you use? These are some of the resources that they've referred to. The Green Meeting Industry Council and MPI are the strongest. There are also other really good, important websites that can be referred to, lots of information. If you go to the MPI site, our report is able, you can download that there too. So everybody's kind of kicking in on that. What would you need, basically, to implement more sustainable strategies? Well, more information on how to do it. Well, we know that there's lots of information out there. So it's kind of resolved if people go to those resources. And cost savings. They're finding, you're finding, that cost savings are really important as a motivator to get this job done. So if we can communicate, not that we're wa waving the earth flag, but to our client that these are the steps we're taking to make this event greener, and by the way, it will also be less expensive because we're doing these things that will save you money, like not little bottles of water for everybody. So again, the ROI is coming from cost savings and, and as part of the sustainable uh, strategy. What are the following areas that you incorporate? Food and beverage, interestingly, are very strong. On-site operations of recycling. It's good to see these recycling bins all through this uh, convention center. Communication strategies, right? My whole presentation is a PDF. My handout, which is the report, is a PDF. You know, five years ago, you would have walked in and everybody would have a 150-page thing on their seat, right, that you may flip through and put on a shelf or something and, and all those trees gone. So these are some of the things that you're doing, um, top line, and we're going to be obviously um, monitoring this year after year. Uh, do you find that the suppliers are meeting your needs? Um, and 60% said sometimes. 22% um, said yes. Um, and do you plan on incorporating more green sustainable practices? These are the meeting professionals again. About 75% are into this. So this is, like I said, this is the bright light, the green light in the overall consumer, business, and meeting professional industries around travel. It's really about you. So let's talk a little bit about case studies. And then I'm trying to sort of end a little bit on the early side so that I could we can all share some case studies among ourselves. This is just literally a few. There are some really inspiring case studies out there. 
touching on a few will just give us a few ideas. Oh, that's what San Francisco is doing, or that's what Kimpton is doing, and so forth. But these are by no means the exclusive list. I know all of you probably have things that you can share as well, and that's what I'd like to hear you know, us share at the end. So Kimpton Hotels has a deep commitment to the environment. They have their Earth Care program. Um, it's part of their mission statement. When you sign up for Kimpton's InTouch program, which is their loyalty program, you have an opportunity to check a box for their Earth Care program. So this does two things. One is it lets every consumer who stays at, Kim at Kimpton know that you are committed to the environment and you can click and learn a lot more about their environmental initiatives. The other good thing is that they can track you, okay? So if you're staying at Kimpton Hotels and you've checked that box, they know that these are environmentally aware members of their program they can see how much business they're bringing to the hotel and track that growth over time as well. So there's another way to track ROI. So I asked these different case studies to, to recommend to you what they, they suggest. So first of all, their three components are linen use, reuse program, okay? Recycling of paper, plastics, composting of food waste, energy strategies, including uh, the, the sensors and the rooms and so forth. So these are some of the things that they're doing really from an ROI side, again, from the operations side. And they have advice for the hotels, get with it, and feel free to ask for help. <laughs> so again, you have this, you can refer back to it. If I had three hours, I'd be glad to go into every detail, but we really don't. So this is just sort of top line again. Um, they have meetings, they have committees, they have overall employee groups that are uh, working with the company to make sure that these things aren't greenwashing and that they are really doing the the trick. So they have these meetings, um, they send out memos, things that each of the properties can do. It's ongoing. And this is an ongoing topic, right? Weston Bonaventure, they uh, certify their property um, with the green seal, and they have also um, been very good about tracking their ROI. They've identified a cost reduction of $316,000 uh, per year, about 6.8% um, savings by implementing green practices. Now, you know how difficult it is to grow your business by 6.8%. It's much easier to do some very systematic and fundamental cost-cutting, earth-saving things to earn that money much easier. Um, advice for other hotels, consider the ROI and environmental impact. We have to consider ROI and environmental impact. We can't just keep throwing stuff away, right? I mean, ultimately this costs money. We can't keep polluting the air because ultimately it costs in health care and disease and everything else that we're troubled with. These are real costs. So consider the ROI in that, sort of more of a spiritual perspective, I guess, savings and future business for your hotel. Three really important areas of what makes them motivated and where they're finding their ROI. Double Tree Hotel in Portland, I think they're doing a phenomenal job as well. Um, Steve Fostlick, I think, is, is the um, sales manager's name, who is, is spearheading this. I'll be happy to send out any links and referrals so that you can get more deeper information about this. But they've identified $80,000 a year savings in electricity, $26,000 savings in gas, $80,000 savings in water just by these cons conservation efforts. And then ultimately, it makes their customer happy and they earn loyalty. Airports are doing something now, too. Um, it's interesting, in Portland, they started the idea of having a, a basin at the outside of security where people can pour out their water bottle. And then right when you go through security on the other side, they have a fountain where you can fill up your water bottle. And in San Francisco, how many of you have been to Terminal 2? Terminal 2. Oh, it's so cool. You got it. it's, the, it's the airport of the future. They sell, all the, the vendors there sell water in these um, petroleum-free bottles. They're made of corn. And the cool thing about this is that it doesn't leach chemicals into the water. You know, if you look at all the other water bottles, they say, do not reuse. Because if we use it, then it starts to break down and you're starting to drink the bottle, not just the water. In this case, it doesn't leach and there's no harsh chemicals. So I've traveled around this for, with this for about two months and I just fill it up again. And it's been great. It really works. So there are things that we're doing. And it, it may sound little by little, like baby steps, but all taken together, they start to become big steps. And that's what gets inspiring. And Seattle's doing something really interesting. They're taking all the coffee grounds from all the uh, concessions, and they are composting it. 
and there's a farm nearby where all those coffee grounds go in and they help the farms grow. So there are innovative things that are happening, um, but I think if, you can, if you're in the airline or airport world, check out what San Francisco has done with their Terminal 2. I think Terminal 2 is something like 90% uh, reused or recycled materials to build the entire terminal. It's really inspiring. It's full of light and there's organic food and it's just, it's really pretty cool. So Travelocity, I think, is another good case study. They're obviously an online travel agency, um, but they're very committed to the, the green side of things and they're also working with business travel. Um, they have their Travel for Good area. They have a podcast series which lets consumers and business travelers download it and start to learn about some of the things that they can do as they're traveling to conserve the environment. They also have, through their green segment, they indicate which are the properties that are eco-friendly using third-party um, verification. So if they qualify based on those third-party verifications, then they qualify to be in their green collection, and of course they partner with hotels that are already taking those steps. So that's Travelocity. So some of their key learnings I think are important too. Reduce our own environmental footprint. Whatever office we're in, whether it's a small two-person or four-person or 10-person office, we can all take these steps personally. And we have to. We really need to you know, walk the walk, so to speak. So look at your own uh, footprint. Promote environmentally responsible, sustainable business practices. So that's what they're doing through their podcasts and their search engine. And offer your customers products and services that will help them promote sustainable travel. So what they're trying to do is get that kind of viral effect that, oh, I bought from Travelocity and they helped me reduce my carbon footprint. Maybe you should check out Travelocity's green webpage. And that kind of gets that going and that's what they help facilitate, which is obviously good for their business as well. Expedia also has uh, a green travel guide on their site. They work with Sustainable Travel International. Uh, they're based in Oregon, but they really have um, activities around the world. There are basically, they sell, Carbon offsets, by the way. Um, there are two kinds of companies that will sell carbon offsets. One are the for-profit, the other are the non-profit. And so you might want to take a look at both and see which ones would deliver the best partnership for you. Both are, are doing good work. You also want to see what kind of carbon offset they're doing um, because some are actually, this is interesting, some of these carbon offset resellers are selling into projects that are already being built. So that's what we call non-incremental. What you want to do is give money to a new project that wasn't already funded and built and you're just sort of paying off for them, right? Hopefully that made some sense. Um, so anyway, Sustainable Travel International is good. So as far as the greener meetings go, I love Margaret Mead's quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And that's who's in this room today. So. Let's talk a little bit about CVBs, what some of the CVBs are doing. I think San Francisco, not that I'm just from there, right? But San Francisco is a great case study. They're doing amazing things in the, in the green and uh, sustainable segment. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with Lynn Bruni from, this, from Travel San Francisco um, at a conference and she shared with me some of her slides. Um, basically they have, as a city, uh, banned plastic bags, and so that translates into the CVB as well. So the convention center, there's no plastic bags, period. Uh, they've banned styrofoam, they've banned, banned plastic water bottles. Um, there's mandatory re recycling and composting across the city. If I don't throw my banana peel in my green bin, I could be hauled off to jail. Right? Not that it really happens, but it is on the books as a policy of the city that you know, put the right thing in the right place. And the, the CVB, the, the convention center, is really working towards minimizing or literally eliminating um, the, any, any kind of waste. So they're doing some great things. The Moscone Center also has the largest solar installation on any municipal building in the United States. If you look out from any tall building in most of the southern US, you look at just the top of the building, right? But you think about all the solar energy that those could be collecting. Well, San Francisco is covered with fog, but they're still making an impact by putting solar panels on their roofs and paying basically for most of their electricity. Uh, recycling and composting, and they have at this point a 75% diversion rate, which means that instead of a big black trash bin, 75% of it is going into composting and to recycling. So it's really inspiring what they're doing. So they have resources for meeting professionals. 
um, on their website, Green Your Meeting. And if you go into that, you get newsletters, you get welcome kits, you get all kinds of information. Virginia Beach, not to just say that you know San Francisco being San Francisco is the only one out there. Everybody's really having good success with this. Virginia Beach is another really good example. Um, their, uh, their visitor centers, their convention center, and so forth. Pittsburgh is another amazing example, right? I don't know if you've been to that, but it's a very uh, sustainably oriented um, convention center. So from their perspective, they did teamwork. They said, we can't do this alone. And it's true, nobody really can. But from the Convention Visitors Bureau perspective, they need to have greener products, right, to deliver to meeting professionals and to business travelers and so forth. So they partnered. They got everybody around the table and they said, what can we all do together to make this happen? And they created kind of this affiliation to bring everybody up to a higher level. And they, they, uh, they actually created their own certification called Virginia Green. Um, and this is a little bit of information about that. You can take a look on their website. Um, but you can take uh, green interactive trips on their website and so forth. It's, it's really pretty cool. So what's their advice? Be certain that if you're going to say green and sustainable, that you are green or sustainable, right? Back to the comment about um, companies that are greenwashing. We are really connected and we start to know who's doing what and what's real. So that's the main advice is if you're going to say these things, then get, you know, roll up your sleeves and make them happen and make it real. Don't just say you're going to become greener. So some of our key findings, I'll just, this is again 150 pages boiled down to one. There are many shades of green travel and there are many shades of green travelers. And the idea of this study, and I think what you'll gain from reading the study, is that the best of us, the greenest of us, the most educated, the most environmentally aware travelers, we still have some work to do. But they are leading the edge in terms of where we should communicate, how we should communicate, and that we should deliver on the promise. So there are many shades of green travelers. Do green travelers really walk the walk? And I put maybe. Um, in some cases, they will, but is your price good? Do you have internet in the rooms? You know, do you have a, a gym on site? Those kinds of things seem to be priorities. But if you deliver green, then they appreciate it and they make full use of it. They have a low tolerance for high premiums, so that green tax idea, you can't just jack up the price because you're doing a greener product. They don't expect that. They know that your ultimate ROI comes from savings. Um, travel industry's sustainability practices, according to consumers, needs work. Green leadership vacuum, there is room for differentiation. And what I mean by that is it's kind of a hodgepodge out there right now. There's some companies doing some things, some companies doing others, some not doing much. But from a consumer perspective, they don't really know yet who's doing the best job. And of course, if they can identify who's doing the best job, that's where the business will go. Uh, green skepticism, uh, there is a need for certification. As I said, there's lots of certification. I think what really I mean to say here is there needs to be some consistency in certification. Um, the green um, sustainability initiative, I'm mangling that, but there's a, a global um, protocol for what is really green in terms of the travel industry. And different organizations have different mixes of that list of protocol. The reason I mentioned the Sustainable Travel International is they have the most, basically, of, of all those global uh, sustainability policies. We're very influenced by each other. I didn't get a whole lot into advertising and marketing, but we tell each other. And so that means that if you deliver a good product or service and deliver on your promise, that they will tell everybody else. They'll tell other meeting professionals. They'll tell business uh, clients where they're going and why. And that's really important. And the most sustainable um, sector we found is meeting professionals. And it's not just because I'm standing here in front of you trying to make you like me, but the reason is that it's real, that meeting professionals really are paving the way, I think, for better sustainability, real best practices. So where's the ROI in greener meetings? First of all, it's in your operations. Whatever your operations. I know some of you are probably your operations just mean your your uh, smartphone. But others of us have big physical plants and are operating chains of hotels or large companies. 
And that's really where we first see the ROI. The second is in HR, and that shouldn't be overlooked. When your employees can morally get behind what you're doing and create employee resource groups and help the company get greener and more sustainable, it makes them more proud to be an employee of that company. And that is great for your HR. It reduces your turnover and it improves the overall um, health of the, of the environment there. Third is sales and marketing, positioning and leveraging your best practices. So what I'm saying is not sales and marketing in terms of the, the green tax. What I'm saying is sales and marketing in terms of positioning, in terms of communications, in terms of leveraging the steps that you've taken and letting people know that these are the steps you're taking. They want to know that. They're looking for it, but a lot of them aren't finding what you're doing. If it's all internal, maybe you think they don't care that you're saving electricity or you're saving on water, right? But they do, and they want to know what you're doing to take these steps, and then they will support you. Market share, first to market. I think there's still an opportunity for first to market in this segment. Even though all of us are doing, you know, certain, taking certain steps in certain ways, nobody is really, as far as consumers are telling us, and we list all the brands and everything, nobody is telling us this company is really doing the best job and therefore they get our loyalty. It's kind of a mix right now. So there's still, I think, a huge opportunity for this inevitable trend. And finally, leadership. It is the right thing to do. A lot of people will be motivated by number one, uh, making number five number one that it is the right thing to do, and that's great. Whatever the motivation's in here, all five of them really need to be there. The right thing to do is ultimately what happens, and ultimately we live, or live in a more sustainable and healthy planet, okay? So that's the ultimate thing. But that, unfortunately, isn't enough to drive a lot of decision makers and people who are pushing pencils and creating spreadsheets. So we need to demonstrate to them that the return on investment comes in savings. And when we can reduce our carbon footprint, we're also reducing our costs and we're a more profitable company. Which lets me circle back right to the beginning when I went to my first um, Earth Day celebration in 1969. It really was all about the right thing to do. We didn't know anything about ROI. We didn't know anything about savings. We just knew that we were destroying the planet step by step and we needed to stop that trend. And then when gas got cheap again, everybody forgot about that because we didn't see the return on investment. Now, I think it's a completely different world. Nobody has an unlimited budget on anything. We're all under the, the microscope, microscope. And so therefore, we have an opportunity to make these changes based on best business practices. So every great movement must experience three stages, ridicule, discussion, and adoption. I think we're in the middle one now. Um, I experienced the first one quite a lot. Um, but I think we're out of that. I think most people, although there, there are some people out there who are still ridiculing us, we know those people, but the reality is that the vast majority, I think, of our country and, and the world is getting at least into the discussion phase and hopefully taking steps into adoption. So what are our next steps? Um, if you want a copy of this presentation, you leave a business card or take a business card. If you want this report, our 150-page report, right now you can just send an email with your name and your company name to report at CMI Green. Hit send and within seconds you'll have the link. Okay, so that makes it very easy. But if you want this PowerPoint presentation, just leave your card and I'll, send, I'll upload it and you can click and, and download that too. But I wanted to save a few minutes now to, for discussion. Um, not so much questions and answers as this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. This is how I think you can take steps too. Yes, the first suggestion. Yeah. It, I know, right? It's crazy. Because now we have case studies time after time of CVBs and hotel groups saying, no, look at we saved $366,000 this year. So we just need to put this in front of whoever's making those decisions and get those case studies out there and, and get us talking and saying, no, it doesn't cost to 
save the environment. It actually saves money, and that's where the ROI is. It's all education. It's all communication. I really appreciate MPI giving me the opportunity to share some of this today because I want that conversation to continue, and I, it's not just idle gossip. It's, it's hard facts. So go to the, the Weston Bonaventure and ask them for their spreadsheet. They're happy to share it with you. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Oh, wow. Kind of like a researcher is going to talk to you too, right? <laughs> yeah. I think it's exciting. Yeah. Yep. Yep, they're saving money. We just have to talk. We just have to get the word out. Yes. Sure. Mm. Good point. So I'm going to repeat that, and I'd love to get anybody who's had that experience and has an answer. Um, I have some ideas, but I'd love to get other people to, to talk. So the point here is that indoors, basically, we have control. The, the client or the, you know, the end user is going to you know, recycle, and they're going to reuse the sheets and so forth. But then when we have an outdoor event, which she has to do one every time she does a, a, a program, then all the trash comes out, right? I mean, all the stuff that gets thrown away. So my perspective is two things. One is compost, because a lot of companies now are creating compostable cups, plates, potato base. I mean, go to SFO, honestly. All the cutlery at SFO2 is made out of potatoes. And it doesn't dissolve in your mouth, don't worry. It, it's, it's real plastic, but it's made from potatoes, and you throw it in the compost bin, and then it becomes dirt again. So there are solutions there, but there are also plastic reusable uh, plates and cups. Anybody else have ideas? Yes. Well, just to her comment that doing outdoor events, I work on Mexican Chemical area, okay. and I work for a large company, and they're both lazy and hard to take care of. Mm -hmm. And they have a Mm. Nice, nice. There may be a service like that in other cities too. That sounds very San Francisco, but hopefully that's spreading. Right. Yeah. Yep. Demand. Hmm. Good point, good point here is, is create the demand. Tell them that, hey, you may, you may not have our meeting if you can't provide us with an alternative to a mountain of, of you know, landfill at the end of this. Any other comments, ideas? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. I love that. Great, great. So the idea here is that when she checked into the Westin here in Orlando, she was given the option of, of basically opting out of housekeeping for the week. And by doing that, she not only was able to save the planet in her own way, but also they gave her a $5, which is a lot less than they saved, right? But they gave her $5 every day as a, as a hotel credit. So that's fantastic. I think it's what, 30 to 50 to $80 to service a room. So they're saving a huge amount and giving you a little bit that makes you feel good. Excellent. All Western hotels, okay. So that's great. So we're learning hopefully from each other. Yes.
Yes. But we it will involve a green practices and environmental practices are good for everybody. But the main the main thing is that you really gotta have a different perspective into approaching the whole thing because you gotta keep creating that. Sense. You do right now. And you do have to provide alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, right? Or the opposite, where things and then somebody else takes the time to separate everything sure. and put it in. Because there's countries where there's no waste, like India. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or Brazil. Yeah. yeah. So you gotta find so many ways from uh, gifts or made from recycled materials or for yeah. It's a really good point. Basically, he's saying you have to deliver on the promise, and there are so many different ways to do it. His comment was, it's great you have these three bins, and then you watch the housekeeper come and throw it all into the, the trash bin, right? So it's like, oh, my God, everything that we've done, I hope nobody saw that, right? So we have to deliver on the promise, and you really need every level of your operations to be behind this. And that, again, comes to education. What's in it for them? You know, not only is the environment more healthy and so forth, but maybe incentives to make sure that they stay on the program. I think we may have time for one or two more. Yes. Ideas? Any ideas? I examples? Case studies? Yes. Nice. <laughs> nice. When you have generated X amount of energy, you actually got a discount for the dinner. Fantastic. Organic, locally produced food. Fantastic. So I'll repeat that because I think they want that on video and I think it's, a, it's an amazing way of being innovative. In the hotel gym, they have bikes that when you're working out, you're also generating electricity and then however much electricity you generate becomes a value in terms of the, the kroner and then you can go and spend that in the restaurant. I think that's beautiful. And, the, and even at the restaurant, they're serving locally sourced organic foods. So full cycle. That's excellent. And I should also mention, um, we asked in our survey which destinations are doing the best job of communicating their, their sustainability and their green practices. And Costa Rica was written in. We didn't list anything. We just say write in the destination that's doing the best job. And Costa Rica is definitely out there doing it right. One more, yes. Just it's, uh, the Holiday okay, Holiday Inn Crown Plaza. That's great. There's no reason why, when when hotels are replacing their elect their their equipment, right? Why not put those in? This is what's inspiring and what's what's exciting about this. And it may sound like, well, yeah, that's just one hotel. But as we start to adopt this, it gets to be uh, a momentum. That's our last one. Hmm. No. Yeah, replacement. But, you know, hotels are being renovated pretty much every day. <laughs> if, if you're replacing anyway, you know, you know, sure. it yep. breaks down the line and they need to be reduced. Right, exactly. And that's a really good point. When we're talking about savings and ultimately ROI, we're not going to save money for our hotel if we go in there and we say we have to replace all the windows today with, with uh, better windows. But if in three years we're going through the process of floor by floor replacing all the windows, let's look into it and let's do it then. Thank you very much for your time and I hope this helped.